Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this documentary film. Today we embark on a journey of knowledge and discovery as we delve into the intricate web of events and individuals that shape the world we inhabit today. The illustration you are currently viewing is titled The Swedish Tiger's Repressed Memories, which we have also chosen as the name for this documentary. A Swedish tiger is a direct translation of the Swedish phrase en svensk tiger, which was utilized in a Swedish propaganda campaign during the Second World War to instill a sense of apprehension regarding discussing the war. It is a clever wordplay signifying that a Swede keeps his mouth shut. Let's just say that a revision of the historical account of what really happened during the last century and what players were acting behind the scenes is long overdue. Our intention is not only to uncover the interests that fueled the two world wars and ignited the flames of the Cold War, but also to unearth the underlying cause that has molded our modern existence, a cause intricately woven into a strategic plan spanning the last century. The scope of this subject is vast, encompassing a multitude of events and personalities far beyond our capacity to fully encompass. Nevertheless, we have chosen to concentrate on the most prominent figures, meticulously illustrating the interconnected networks and historical occurrences, both parallel and sequential, from a geopolitical perspective over the course of the past two centuries. By doing so, we aim to furnish you, the listener, with a comprehensive understanding of how we arrived at this critical juncture in history. To chart the course of our future, we must first navigate the labyrinth of our past. Before we proceed, it is only fitting that we extend our heartfelt gratitude to Karl Norberg, whose profound insights have enriched the contents of this documentary. Despite facing formidable opposition from both individuals and establishments, Karl has fearlessly bridged the gaps in our collective memory, resurrecting fragments of our forgotten past. It is his expertise in economics, geopolitics, history, and emotional comprehension that has breathed life into this work, a testament to his unwavering dedication and profound wisdom. And so we begin with a tale that may ring familiar to many, an account oft repeated, but as the adage goes, repetition begets wisdom, and it is through revisiting these echoes of the past that we can truly glean its timeless teachings. The creation of the Federal Reserve. It was in the year 1913 when the United States established the Federal Reserve, orchestrated through the influence of an international banking conglomerate. The Federal Reserve Act was surreptitiously passed during the Christmas week, a time when the majority of the American state administration reveled in the joyous festivities with their loved ones. President Woodrow Wilson, having received financial support from these very banking interests during his presidential campaign, swiftly pledged to enact the bill. However, the true intentions behind this alliance only became clear to him at a later stage, when the consequences had already taken hold, a revelation he would deeply lament and put into writing. In his own poignant words, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. We have come to be one of the worst governed, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. No longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. These profound reflections were penned by Woodrow Wilson himself, mere moments after signing the creation of the Federal Reserve. Among the architects and creators of this influential institution, one name stands out. Paul Warburg. It is with the Warburg family that our extraordinary tale begins. The origins of the Warburg family trace back to Italy, where they were known as Del Banco, However, their story took a new turn when they settled in the German city of Warburg in 1559, adopting the name of their newfound home. Over time, branches of this illustrious family spread their roots in the United States, Scandinavia and England, leaving an indelible mark on history. We are about to embark on a biographical journey into the life of a certain Eric M. Warburg. The Spider in the Web 
As a transatlantic commuter with an extensive personal network, he became intricately connected to key institutions, organizations, and important individuals. While Eric Warburg never pursued a political post or a career in politics, he maintained close relationships with influential and powerful members of these circles. In the United States, one of Warburg's most remarkable high-profile contacts was John J. McCloy, the former U.S. High Commissioner for Germany. In Germany, his close friendship with Helmut Schmidt, Chancellor of Germany from 1974 to 1982, stood out. They shared a passion for sailing, and Schmidt often sought Eric Warburg's advice on German-American relations. Notably, Eric's uncle Paul Warburg and his cousin James Warburg were financial advisors to President Franklin D. Roosevelt, among others. However, it is the friendship with Alan Dulles that stands out as the most remarkable, particularly from a Swedish perspective. The Warburg name is primarily associated with banking, as the family's banking company, Warburg, has been established in Hamburg since the late 19th century. Eric Warburg also earned a reputation as a political and economic advisor, employing his significant diplomatic skills often behind the scenes. Additionally, he played a decisive role in the negotiation of the Jewish Debt Conference after World War II. He belonged to a transatlantic business and social elite whose networks in the 20th century were among the most extensive of their time. Let us now delve into the Warburg family's transatlantic network. Eric Warburg was born during the Wilhelmine era and witnessed his father Max Warburg's success with the family firm M.M. Warburg & Company. His business partners and friends included prominent figures such as Albert Ballin, the architect of modern cruise travel and general manager of the famous Hamburg America Line, as well as Prince von Bülow, former Chancellor of the German Empire. Max Warburg was part of a circle of advisors to the German Emperor Wilhelm II. After the First World War, he participated in the negotiations on the Versailles Treaty as a member of the German delegation. However, he declined the offer to chair the Finance Committee and instead proposed his partner in the Warburg Bank, Karl Melchior. Max Warburg's financial success was evident through his increasing number of board seats before the 1930s. At one point, he served on 27 corporate boards, even though his initial intention was to limit his involvement to Blohm and Voss, Germany's largest shipyard at the time. His last board position was at IG Farben. Although Warburg was forced to relinquish these positions when the Nazis came to power, his board memberships demonstrated the prominent business position of M.M. Warburg and company. Furthermore, these connections laid the foundation for his son Eric's successful maintenance of these business relationships during and after World War II. In addition to Germany and the United States, the Warburg family had established a significant presence in the United States through the marriage of Eric's uncles, Paul and Felix Warburg, and in Sweden, where another brother, Fritz Warburg, resided during both world wars. Paul Warburg, known as the architect of the U.S. Federal Reserve, married Nina Loeb, the daughter of Solomon Loeb, a founder of the Wall Street bank Kuhn, Loeb and company Felix Warburg, on the other hand, married Frieda Schiff, the only daughter of Jacob H. Schiff, a senior partner in the same company and a prominent train magnate. Both Warburg brothers eventually became partners in Kuhn, Loeb & Co., which was the second largest private bank in the United States before the First World War. During the 1920s, Eric Warburg embarked on an apprenticeship on Wall Street. He graduated from high school early and voluntarily entered military service in 1918. After the war, he worked as an apprentice in the banking sector in Frankfurt and Berlin. He also worked at N.M. Rothschild & Son in London, as well as his uncle Paul Cohn Speyer's company Brandeis, Goldschmidt & Co., the largest non-iron metal retailer in England. Finally, his training as an international banker concluded in the United States, where he spent three years. During this time, he resided with his New York relatives, Felix and Frieda Schiff Warburg, in Woodlands near White Plains, New York. Eric Warburg worked at the International Acceptance Bank, IAB, which his uncle Paul Warburg had established after serving with the Federal Reserve Board. IAB sold commercial paper to finance the reconstruction of European countries after the First World War. Due to his close friendship with his cousin Frederick Warburg, 
Eric quickly became acquainted with Frederick's circle of friends, including ambitious Wall Street lawyers and bankers such as McCloy's, Frank Hatch, and George Brownell. Eric's timing was opportune, as his family was rapidly advancing in the upper echelons of American society on the East Coast. During his time on Wall Street, Eric Warburg also conducted business with law firms, including Sullivan and Cromwell. This firm remained involved in US-German business even after the Nazis came to power. The Dulles brothers, Alan and John Foster, who later became head of the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, and US Secretary of State under President Eisenhower, worked at Sullivan and Cromwell. His time as an apprentice in New York laid the foundation for many of the networks and connections that would support his future transatlantic career. In 1938, Eric Warburg traveled to Germany to assist in managing his family's banking firm. Due to the ongoing process of Aryanization, which involved the confiscation of Jewish property in Nazi Germany, conducting banking business in a credible manner became increasingly challenging. It was no longer possible to conceal the fact that one of the largest German banks was run by Jews. Consequently, like many major companies during that time, the Warburgs attempted to relocate their operations to a neutral third-party country with the right of repurchase after the war. They initially chose the Swedish financial family Wallenberg, which sought to redeem the bank with shares in IG Farben, a business conglomerate. Coincidentally, Max Warburg had been forced to leave IG Farben just a few years prior. However, the deal fell through, and the bank was acquired by another party instead. Once the situation in Nazi Germany was resolved, Eric and his parents relocated to the United States. Eric had the advantage of already holding permanent resident status, which facilitated a quick and smooth settlement. As an American citizen, he was able to obtain permission for his parents, Max and Alice Warburg, to stay as well. The following year, Eric established his own company, E.M. Warburg & Co., re-employing former employees from Warburg companies in Europe who had also immigrated to the United States. Among his clients were those fortunate few who managed to bring capital from Europe, particularly from Germany. Warburg's wealth and existing family ties to the United States eased their transition compared to the experiences of many other immigrants. In 1938, an estimated 300,000 German citizens wanted to emigrate to the United States, yet the entry rate was as low as 27,000 per year. Eric Warburg felt more at home in the United States than in Germany. Even before leaving Nazi Germany, he had already chosen the United States as his preferred country for resettlement. His three years spent there during his youth had left a profound impact, and he knew he would feel more at home there than in England, Holland, or Sweden. In addition to running his newly established business, Eric Warburg became involved with various aid committees that aimed to assist stranded refugees in New York in finding homes and work in the country. He served as chairman of the National Committee for Resettlement of Foreign Doctors, a part of the National Refugee Service NRS. Through this role, he helped several hundred German and Austrian doctors settle in the United States. He also provided financial assistance to individuals facing hardship to leave Europe during the war. In 1941, he deposited money into the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee's Transmigration Bureau, facilitating the emigration of three individuals to the United States. When World War II broke out, Eric Warburg once again answered the call to military service. At the age of 42, he was recruited by the U.S. Army Air Force. Like other family members and numerous emigrants, he joined the U.S. Intelligence Service as an information gatherer and analyst leveraging his language skills and extensive knowledge of foreign countries and economies. Warburg became a top interrogator and a liaison between the US and British military intelligence services, a truly remarkable accomplishment. Historian Ron Chernow notes that Warburg's war service allowed him to gain entry into both Washington and Whitehall, where he established powerful friendships that would later aid his post-war career. Indeed, Eric Warburg successfully expanded his network of contacts during and after the war. In May 1945, Eric renewed his acquaintance with Alan Dulles, which likely continued throughout the war. Dulles was now responsible for the German branch of the U.S. Intelligence Service as head of the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, in Switzerland and later in occupied Germany. Through Dulles, 
Vorberg became acquainted with survivors of the German resistance in the summer of 1945, including Fabian von Schlabrendorf, who would later become a judge of the German Constitutional Court. They developed a friendship, although they would eventually find themselves on opposite sides of the negotiating table. When the Conference on Jewish Material Claims and Negotiations against Germany and German companies commenced to provide compensation for those subjected to forced labor in former concentration camps, such as Auschwitz-Birkenau, Erich Vorberg was called upon to act as a neutral broker. The officials seeking compensation chose Warburg due to his familiarity with a number of individuals representing IG Farben, including representatives from Krupp, Siemens and Flick. Warburg also provided offices in the Warburg Bank in Hamburg for meetings between claimants and lawyers from the respective companies. For instance, when it involved Dynamite Nobel AG, an ammunition producer in which Friedrich Flick held an 82% stake, Warburg primarily met and corresponded with Fabian von Schlabrendorf between 1962 and 1967. Despite their close relationship, the negotiations ended unfavorably for the claimants. Friedrich Flick, after years of drawn-out negotiations, claimed a lack of funds. Since Erich Warburg had amusingly refused to participate in the Nuremberg trials, which began in November 1945, he resigned from active duty and returned to New York. In the post-war years, his priority was to revive his New York company. Nevertheless, he remained loyal to the Air Force intelligence community, frequently lecturing at the CIA throughout the 1950s to train future interrogators. As a civilian, he also joined the Council on Foreign Relations, the United States' most prestigious and influential foreign policy think tank in the post-war era, advocating for a bold internationalist agenda. Eric Warburg had re-established contact with the family's old banking company in Hamburg, now known as Brinkmann, Wurz & Company, shortly after the war. In 1949, the Warburg family, represented by Eric M. Warburg, became part owners of the company once again, a surprising turn of events. From that point on, Eric had frequent reasons to travel to Western Germany, especially Hamburg, making him a transatlantic commuter. It wasn't until 1956 that he finally stepped down from the bank's management. Since 1970, the bank has been renamed M.M. Warburg. However, Eric Warburg's efforts were not solely focused on reviving the family bank in Hamburg. His broader goal was to participate in building a bridge between the old and new worlds, particularly Germany and the United States. Having spent numerous years on both sides of the Atlantic, he felt a strong connection to both countries. This official reason also aligned with the post-war NATO doctrine, which aimed to contain Germany through Deutsche Bank via the Federal Reserve, maintain U.S. interests, and prevent Russia from gaining influence in the European market by controlling the strategic flow of natural resources. In pursuit of this objective, he helped establish two organizations, Atlantic Brücker and the American Council on Germany, ACG. Although he only served as the ACG treasurer, he sponsored and assisted on both sides. Through the activities of these organizations, he sought to integrate West Germany into Western societies and foster a robust anti-communist stance. One may wonder whose mission they truly served. Aside from his involvement with these transatlantic elite organizations, Vorberg demonstrated his connection to Germany in various other ways. He openly opposed the Morgenthau Plan, which called for the dismantling of German industries and criticized the Allied policy of industrial plant dismantlement in Western Germany. He arranged a meeting with his old friend John J. McCloy, who had recently been appointed as the U.S. High Commissioner for Occupied Germany in 1949. Warburg argued against the dismantling program, and McCloy eventually gave in and asked Warburg to compile a list of factories to be spared. This list included August Thyssen Steel Mill and Krupp's synthetic gas plant, by the late 1950s, Eric Warburg had assumed the role of head partner in his family's business management and made the decision to permanently return to Germany. Despite initial opposition from his wife, the entire family settled in Hamburg and their children attended German schools. Nonetheless, they maintained strong ties to the United States through relatives and companies. In addition to many American cousins, Eric's younger sister Gisela had married federal judge Charles E. Wazanski. In 1966, Lionel Pincus joined E.M. Warburg and Company, 
and although the company changed its name to Warburg Pincus and Company, Eric remained a partner in the company he established in 1939. Shortly before his definitive return to Hamburg, Warburg joined the American Jewish Committee's Foreign Affairs Committee, AJC, and monitored anti-Semitism in German media, akin to Sweden's Expo, an organization responsible for maintaining the existing ruling order and controlling the sphere of public opinion. While Erich Warburg was born during the Wilhelmine era and experienced the Weimar Republic and the Nazi era, it was his encounter with Soviet communism that most shaped his worldview. Shortly after the ceasefire in 1945, Warburg lobbied General Eisenhower to retain large parts of central Germany rather than giving up Berlin. He believed that preserving 10 million people, human capital, and vital industries potentially intact in central Germany was crucial to maintaining a balance between East and West. He was convinced that following his advice would make it highly unlikely for a communist German republic to be established. He applied a similar argument when persuading John J. McCloy to halt the dismantling of German industries, emphasizing that without a strong economy, the German people would be susceptible to communism. Given his staunch anti-communist beliefs and his commitment to Germany's reconstruction, along with his close ties to the United States, it is difficult to interpret his efforts as anything other than a vested interest in shaping what would become known as the Cold War. Through his multifaceted network, Eric Warburg connected business and industrial communities in Western Germany and the United States. His involvement with Atlantic Brücke and the US Council in Germany facilitated connections with political circles, media outlets, academia, and family contacts. As a representative of the transnational elite that emerged in the post-war era, Eric M. Warburg played a significant role in shaping the Cold War. There are compelling reasons to suspect that Alan Dulles was involved behind the scenes throughout, as described in the book Containing Communism, where Alan Dulles, now chief of the CIA, reportedly stated, President Eisenhower surrendered all his power to me. It is worth noting that Eisenhower himself warned against the military-industrial complex in his farewell speech in 1961 as president. So what kind of entity was it that seemed to be hidden from sight, whose affairs Eric conveyed before, during and after the Second World War? To answer this question, we must first take a look at one of the more successful companies in Swedish history. So we turn our gaze to Sweden. Follow us into part two of this documentary as we delve even further into the Swedish tiger's repressed memories 